Psychology in Seattle. Hey, deserving listeners. Today I'm going to talk about serial killers. I've talked about a number of serial killers before. I've done deep dives on Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer and such. But today I'm I'm going to I'm going to uh, do a little intro here, and then I'm going to play an interview uh, in which I was on the radio. But I want to do a little introduction here first. But first, let me introduce the podcast, which is called Psychology in Seattle. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. So months and months ago, I don't know, six to nine months ago, I got an email from someone asking me to be on their radio program. And I get a fair amount of those emails these days, and uh, I usually turn them down because, I don't know, I'm just kind of busy. But this one seemed kind of interesting, and it seemed like a legit uh, organization. So I emailed them back, and the, uh, the, their people reached out to me and said, yeah, you know, there's this thing, it's, it's this national syndicated radio show, and they want to talk with you about psychology and stuff. And I was like, okay, well, you know, tell, the, tell them to email with me, and we go back and forth, forth for a while. And at a certain point, I start talking with the, the journalist, interviewer, DJ guy, and he starts talking, and I, I ask him, like, well, okay, what do you want to talk about? He's like, well, I just want to talk about everything psychology. And I was like, well, could you narrow it down a little bit? And he says, well, we usually talk about UFOs and parapsychology and the paranormal and Bigfoot and that kind of thing. And I was like, oh, um, I'm sorry about this, but I'm probably not the best person to have on your show because I'm actually a, quite skeptical of the claims that a lot of people make about UFOs and Bigfoot and that kind of thing. And although I'd be happy to talk about it with you, I'm probably not the best person for your audience because everyone's going to hate me, uh, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, no, 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 no. I, I, I love that kind of stuff. We can, we can totally talk about it. And I was like, well, okay. So I said, well, how about a 15-minute thing? So Because it's pretty easy for me to do radio things because they usually call me. And so I just sit in my office in my pajamas and talk on the phone for 15 minutes. And, you know, it's not, not too bad. It's actually not that much time to spend. So I was like, okay, you know, how about 15 minutes? He's like, no, 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 no. My, my radio show is for three hours. So I need you for three hours. <laughs> and I was like, well, no, I, I can't. One... Uh, no, that's too much time. Two, what could I possibly say for two hours, for three hours that would be interesting? It just, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, you don't even know what I am or who I am or what I'm going to say. Again, this is all over email. And I said, uh, how about how about 45 minutes or something? He's like, no, 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 you, you got you to gotta do, okay, two and a half hours. And he goes back and forth and he was a really charming guy. And so I, was, I agreed to it. And I I said, okay, fine, two and a half hours. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about, but okay, you're, it's, it's your show, and if I ruin it, it's on you, I guess. He's like, yeah, it's on me. And my show starts at 9 p.m. West Coast time. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, 9 to 11.30. All right, screw it. I mean, he, he just came across as this really likable guy, and so I agreed to it. And so I proceed to completely forget all that conversation, it's on my schedule. It comes up and he calls. He calls me, you know, because that's usually the deal they call me. So he calls at the allotted time at 9 p.m. last night. And I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I, I've forgotten all about the Bigfoot thing. I've forgotten all about the paranormal and the UFOs. And we have a few minutes to talk as the intro, the producers for this radio station are, you know, putting music on and commercials and this kind of thing. And so uh, we have a few minutes, I have a few minutes to talk with the, with the interviewer guy, the main radio guy. And I'm like, so what are we talking about today? And he says, oh, we're going to talk about the psychology of serial killers. And I'm like, serial killers. Oh, okay. Well, to be honest, I don't actually know that much about them, but I can give it my best shot. And he's like, no, no, you're going to be great. You're going to be great. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we're on live in three, two, one. And he, and he you know, he does this, you know, radio intro, uh, intro where it's got all the snazzy voices and this snazzy intro. And he introduces me and it's going pretty well. And I'm like, okay, yeah, most of that's accurate. And then he gets to the final line and he says, 
And, you know, Dr. Gurkhana is an expert on serial killers. He's talked about the Green River Killer and Ted Bundy, and it, it's much more eloquent than that and has much more gravitas. And he introduces me, and I'm like, oh, shit, like, what? Green River Killer, that's a, if you don't know, it's a local serial killer here in Seattle. I've never looked into the Green River Killer. I have, I, I don't know anything about them. I, the, him, the only thing I know about him was from what I remember growing up as a kid and hearing news stories about, I think they were uh, sex workers being found in ditches or something. And I was like, what have I gotten myself into? And we're live on the radio at this point. <laughs> it's, it's pumped out all over the nation. Uh, he's actually, he's stationed in Canada, but it the radio is all over the United States. And I, <laughs> so I'm panicking. I'm thinking, okay, well, I got to do the best I can. And he asks me uh, question after question after question. And I'm trying my best to answer, but I'm also trying my best to give a lot of caveats. Like, so by the way, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on serial killers. I'm not an expert on this. I'm not an expert on that. I, I, I don't have the research in front of me, so, but for my memory. So I use a lot of those kind of caveats. And as we're you know, going into the two and a half hours, I'm thinking, you know what? I bet you his audience are the sort of people who love serial killers. And hearing me talk about this must be excruciating to them because I have no idea what I'm talking about because this is not my area. Uh, I've, you know, if I give me enough time to prepare for an episode, say on Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, or someone like that, and give and put the notes in front of me and give me the ability to edit my own episode, and I, I'm, I'm, I can pull it off. But if you're just gonna rattle off questions, because just a little picture into my life, you know, I'm a clinician, one, I'm a supervisor, two, I'm a teacher, three, and I'm a podcaster, four, and in the, you know, the 40 hour work week that I have, I rarely think or talk about or hear about uh, serial killers because it's just not a relevant thing in my clinical or educational life. I can't think of a time serial killers were ever brought up in graduate school because, but now people outside of graduate school, outside of the profession might think that's all we talk about, but we don't. Why? Because they're extremely rare individuals. These, the people who are, you know, the Ted Bundys of the world are extremely rare and you could even specialize in murder and criminal uh, forensics and probably never come across a, a serial killer. So it's just not interesting. I mean, psychopathy it, the the much broader uh, condition of psychopathy or antisocial, or what a lot of people are are calling so, sociopathy, is also a very specialized field. And uh, there's a possibility that in my life, treating thousands of people for twenty plus years, I've never treated a classic psychopath before. It's just an extremely rare condition and they're not likely to show up voluntarily for therapy, which is the sort of people I treat. So <laughs> after, after doing the episode, I thought, well, because you know, before I did the episode, I thought, well, sometimes, you know, when I do these radio shows, I can, I can pull the audio and share it with my listeners because I find that when I'm on the radio, when I'm being interviewed, when I'm not in control and I'm being interviewed by someone, it tends to bring out a different sort of mode of me and a, and different kinds of material that I wouldn't come up with otherwise. And I think that can be, you know, kind of interesting uh, uh, material uh, for the listeners. It's like, you know, the sort of questions maybe people would want to ask me, but I, I just don't think to bring up on the podcast or something. I don't know. And so... Uh, at the end of the recording, I thought, well, I'm never sharing that with anyone because I'm sure I made a fool out of myself the entire time. And then I woke up today and I was like, well, I don't know. Let's just give it to the listeners and see what they think. And if I say enough caveats at the beginning, maybe they'll take it easy on me. I don't know. Maybe there's a couple good moments in this. I don't know. So this is the interview in which I was on Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. That's Spaced Out Radio. You can find them on some radio stations, like live, like actually tuning into the radio, which I haven't done in years. But it's also on a podcast, and it's also on um, 
on YouTube, so you can check and SoundCloud, so you can check it out in all those different places. So let's get to it. Dr. Kirk Honda has been practicing psychology since 1996 and is a professor at Antioch University since 1998. He is the host of the Psychology in Seattle podcast, which has over 700 episodes on topics such as theory, advocacy, and pop culture. During his podcast, Dr. Honda has also taken a long look at the sinister minds of some of the world's most notorious serial killers. From the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway, to Ted Bundy, Dr. Honda has looked into the minds of what causes people to have the urge to hurt and potentially kill on a frequent basis. We'll find out what this is all about. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire brought to you by Paranoia Magazine, Dr. Kirk Honda. We take the time to say hello to you and welcome to Spaced Out Radio. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to talking with you. We're looking forward to hearing you too. You know, when you decided that you wanted to get into becoming a doctor and getting into psychology and psychotherapy, what intrigued you about the human mind that you wanted to figure out what people were all about? Well, I grew up like anyone else in relationships with my family and friends and I suppose early dating in high school and college and big concern to me was how to cultivate relationships that was mutually beneficial to everybody. <laughs> that was one thing. Another thing was just observing other people. And I, I, as a young child, my family would say that I, I was very observant. That was what they would, the description they would have for me. At the age of like three or four or five, they said that I would just like stare at everyone, the family, the older, my older siblings, just like watching everyone do things. <laughs> and, uh, so I suppose there's a little bit of that, just just a fascination with the human condition. Was there anything or any type of event that kind of triggered that way? Or was it just that natural curiosity growing up? Nothing particular. In it. I mean, I went to therapy when I was about, I don't know, 22 or something, because I just felt like I wanted to talk about things. I wanted to get things off my chest. And I felt like my friends weren't the best listeners. <laughs> Uh, college age boys in Seattle. And so I think that might have planted the seed, but I hadn't thought about being a therapist until uh, this one day I was in traffic. I was, a, I was working at a business that was a contractor for Microsoft here in Seattle. And I was on a track to become a business person, you know, wear a suit, go to the office nine to five. I just saw my life sort of stretched out before me and I thought, okay, it's not a bad life. But I thought, there's got to be something else that feels more meaningful to me. And I thought, well, how about a teacher? And I was like, no, nah, I don't really like speaking in front of people. And I don't like corralling kids. And then being a therapist just popped into my head. Well, that's kind of cool. So you kind of fell into it. And that, and that has led to some very intriguing conversations. As you started to study people, was there a specific type of person that really, really piqued your interest? Whether male, female, uh, I guess gender really doesn't matter in regards to it. But was there something that kind of piqued your interest on how the human body and the human mind works? Well, in the beginning, since I'm a musician... I wanted to become a therapist for bands, you know, like Metallica or the Smashing Pumpkins or something. Good choices. So that really intrigued. Yeah, because bands like the Beatles, they break up and it makes me really sad. And I always think, man, if they just had a therapist to help them talk about their feelings, they'd still be together. And as a person who has been in a number of bands myself, I've always said that being in a band, being a musician, working with other musicians is like being married, but you don't have sex with each other uh, unless you're Fleetwood Mac or something. But you don't get to have the sort of intimacy that bonds a marriage together. Um, yet you have all the same ups and downs, the same intimacy, the same uh, conflict. Bands don't usually think about going to a therapist, but, but as soon as I graduated from graduate school, I soon realized that bands didn't want to go to therapy, so I had to switch to a, a different sort of focus. Well, growing up in Seattle, I mean, man, in the 90s there, you had your pick. Holy cow. Yeah. 
between Nirvana and, you know, Guns N' Roses stuff, but Kagan was from there, Temple of the Dog, Pearl Jam, Stone Temple, or not Stone Temple Violence, uh, well, what, Soundgarden, you really had your pick. I mean, that was a good time in Seattle's music days. Yeah, it was a time when uh, music was fresher in the early 90s anyway, for us anyway, and it seemed that everyone was in a band, including me. But it wasn't your turn. You were hanging out at the wrong clubs, man. You didn't have enough grunge or maybe enough heroin. One of the two. Maybe that was the secret ingredient I never had. Well, it worked for a few people. That's for sure. So as you started to to, to try and uh, make your place and your niche and your career, how did it end up turning into serial killers and, and concentrating on the, some of the most warped minds that could be out there? Well, to be clear, I'm not an expert on serial killers. Uh, in fact, in your intro, you talked about the Green River Killer. I, I don't think I've ever talked about the Green River Killer. <laughs> I actually don't know that much. I've talked about Ted Bundy a few times, um, and I suppose other psychopaths and sadists. What really drew me to it, because in my practice, I actually don't, I, I rarely treat these sorts of people. I've never treated a serial killer. Those are pretty rare individuals, but psychopaths um, I've treated very rarely. But the fascination or the interest or the, the studying of it actually began when I started my podcast, which I started 11 years ago. And people would send in questions. And a very popular thing that people wanted me to talk about were people like Ted Bundy, Charlie Manson, this sort of thing. So I started to study it, started to study psychopathy, antisocial, uh, sadism, Machiavellianism, dark tetrad, all the kinds of things. And over the years, I have learned enough where I can speak with some authority on it. Although people who actually treat these people in uh, institutions would know much more than me. Well, in regards to some of the topics that you've studied, whether it's Charles Manson or Ted Bundy, for people who may not know what a lot of these terms are, what exactly is a psychopath? So psychopaths are people who uh, fit the criteria that Hare put forth. Uh, there's 20 items. The notable ones to think about are lack of empathy, uh, impulsivity, uh, callousness, uh, charming, pathological lying, using other people for your own gain, uh, criminal versatility, meaning you tend to commit a wide variety of different types of crimes, sexual promiscuity, um, irresponsibility, bad planning. Uh, there's a very classic profile of someone who does this sort of thing that, that we call a psychopath. Is everybody or does everybody have that ability to, to all of a sudden snap and go down that road? Like what takes the mind into that area? Generally, it's hard to know. We, we barely understand anything about the brain and behavior in terms of why. Uh, was it evolution? Is it in the genes? Is it environment? But from the prevailing wisdom, the consensus is that some people are born with the um, disposition that could lead them to psychopathy and pair that up with experiences that are difficult, uh, traumatic, and uh, cultivate that sort of psychopathic personality, then that's what usually blossoms into a psychopath. So you could be treated poorly, really badly, but if you don't have the genetic disposition for psychopathy, then the prevailing wisdom is you won't develop it. So you need, you need the, the building block, so to speak. But you could take someone who uh, has the genetic disposition, and if you treat them well enough growing up, they might not actually develop into what would be labeled as a psychopath, although they might have some traits. So with that, does that start out at childhood with maybe being in an abusive home, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the classics, as you mentioned, but it could, it could be a lot of things. There's a lot of other kinds of mistreatment or, uh, you know, sometimes just a bad match between parents and kid where the parents are very extroverted, very active, and the kid is very introverted and very quiet. And the parent and the kid just never really understand each other. And that can lead to the child growing up in an environment where they just don't feel loved or secure the way they 
uh, they look around at their siblings who are perhaps more extroverted and they just feel bad about themselves. And, you know, you repeat that day in and day out for years and years. And that can be just as damaging as just flat out abuse. Isn't that what happened in the Columbine shootings with the two with the two killers there, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, because weren't they bullied? Weren't they feeling that they were more introverted? I actually don't know that much about them. Uh, from I, I remember learning about them years ago, so I can't speak to them specifically. I do know that they felt bullied. It's hard to know with teenagers because young minds, young brains are still developing. And, you know, if you've been around kids or you have kids, you see that things change and their personality changes. You know, one year they're they're sullen and in their bedrooms all the time. And the next year they're out and about and, you know, mixing it up with everybody. And it's just hard to know. So those two boys, if they had grown up and managed not to do that, would they have grown up to be consistently psychopathic and problematic with people around them? Or would they have just grown up to, was it just a phase that they could have grown out of? We will just never know, obviously. So it's hard to say, but it's likely that it, cause it wasn't one of them more influential on the other in that relationship. I believe so. I believe so. Yeah. So at least one of them probably had some sort of conduct disorder. And of course, experts on those two individuals probably have like a ton of psycho history that they can pull upon in terms of abuse and all that kind of stuff. But, but the thing is, is that for every one or two of those boys who do just horrific atrocious things. There are thousands of other boys with the exact same background, the exact same dispositional traits with access to guns, and they don't do that. So it's, it's a huge mystery as to what causes, so to speak, individuals to, to take that leap. Is it a fine line, though? especially in the teenage years where, you know, I mean, I don't want to go down the path of school shootings or or get too heavily into them, but we see a lot of that over the last few years. And we've seen a lot of innocence, you know, lost in children going to school. I mean, who would have thought back when you or I were growing up or most of our listeners growing up that you'd have to have armed guards at school? I mean, that just seems incredulous. Right. So there's two factors at play. Uh, There's a lot of factors at play, but the two factors that are different than when you and I were growing up was one, suicide rates are rising, especially among young people. So most of these individuals, in my opinion, I mean, obviously their murderous behavior is awful, but the the primary concern should be on their suicidal motivations because they're often suicidal. They often want to die and that's where it begins. They're hopeless. They feel thwarted by other people. They, they don't feel like they're, it's ever going to change. And they want to kill themselves. And countless people uh, in the United States and around the world, they just kill themselves. And it's quiet. It doesn't make the news. And it's not very interesting to the Internet. But every once in a while, some of those individuals say, you know what? Before I go out, I'm going to take some people out with me because I'm angry at the way I've been treated. And so those are the people that we hear about, but it's really the suicide. So suicide's on the rise. Um, this, the second thing that's different about when we were kids is the media. So when we were kids, if someone did something like this, it, it would take, I don't know, maybe a week or so. Maybe, maybe it would show up on the weekend newspaper and it would be on page three or something. And it definitely wouldn't make national news. Because there just wasn't that conduit, you know, and it maybe it would make it to some newspaper, some print or something. Today, people can film while they're doing it to Facebook Live or some other streaming thing. So they know that they can get that kind of attention and they know that after they die, due to the way we react to these things in the media, that their name and their face and their manifesto and their, their life story will be plastered everywhere. And there will be multiple books and pieces and movies and documentaries made about them. And they feel somewhat vindicated. Like, you know, they, they want to be heard and they want to tell their story and they feel like no one's listening. And so this is their way to get it out. 
So are you saying then that the majority of these horrific mass shootings are more copycat for attention than somebody actually wanting to go out and say, look, I know I'm going out, but I'm going to take as many people with me and screw the world? Well, I can't say for sure. No one can, because there's no way to know exactly, even if you talk to them, uh, you're not, not sure if they're going to give you an honest answer or an accurate answer. But the data seems to show that. Um, they're, uh, whenever we, so on a smaller level or a less um, internet uh, interesting level is copycat suicide. So we know that when a suicide, and this has been, this has been known for decades, that when a suicide is reported, like a famous person kills himself or someone kills himself in a very flashy manner that makes the news, we know, according to many, many studies, that that will increase suicide in wherever that is reported, particularly if it's reported in the typical sensational uh, news-ish sort of way. So uh, that now with uh, mass murders, mass murder suicides, those are much more infrequent events. So it's harder for us to gather enough data to draw any sort of correlation. But but it, there's strong evidence for that, for sure. Let's talk about the social media aspect of everything here, because with the ability to go on Facebook Live or or Periscope or Twitter Live or YouTube or all of these different streaming areas with video, is there a thought then for a lot of these people who are doing this to try and make it as vulgar as they potentially can in order to one-up the person who did it before? Yeah, certainly. I mean, if you spend any time in certain corners of the internet, there is absolutely that sort of element, 4chan, for example. And it's true. You know, you, you wake up in the morning and you have low self-esteem and you feel like you don't have any friends or you feel sort of beat down from work or your marriage isn't going that well. And you just want to have some fun. You want some attention um, we all know what it feels like to get, you know, you post a picture on Facebook and you get a lot of likes and you're like, oh, wow, it feels nice to get that affirmation. But if that's all you have and you fall into a certain corner of the Internet and you kind of figure out the game, the rules of the game in that corner, then, yeah, that's what happens. And it, there are cases where that spins out of control, where people end up harming other people in some ways. So do you believe then that the state of violence that children see on TV, whether it's television, whether it's video games, movies, does that play a role in not only children and teenagers growing up, but in young adults or change the idea that killing or there is some sort of romanticism with killing? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer as well, because we have to look at things sort of globally and, and trends and, and there's a lot of factors in culture and society that change over time. Uh, and there's been a lot of studies that look at the effects short term, long term, when you expose young people to images of violence and the general consensus, and I'm not an expert in this area, but from my memory, the general consensus is that uh, for certain um, vulnerable individuals, that kind of concentrated uh, exposure, long-term exposure to certain kinds of images can affect them. Uh, but in general, the vast majority of young people know the difference between fantasy violence and real violence. Um, and so there doesn't seem to be negative effects to most young people, but for some young people, it's something definitely to be looking at. Tonight, we are talking about the psychology of serial killers. Joining us from Seattle, Washington, is Dr. Kurt Honda. He is a psychotherapist. He's been doing that for about 20 years now. You also can catch his podcast, the Psychology in Seattle podcast, on iTunes, as well as other areas. Dr. Honda, welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. Thanks. This is fun. Now, right before the break, I had asked you about video games and the way children are 
perceiving them with the violence and everything. And, and you said it was going to take a long time. So I think we should restart there in regards to the forming of the mind on how it accepts murder, blood. And I am actually was quite surprised by your answer that saying that children, even at a young age, know the difference between video game violence and everyday human violence. It's true. Uh, I mean, to take an extreme example, like when you and I were kids, I don't, I, I have a feeling you played Pac-Man when you were a kid, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, yes. I don't know how old you are. Okay. So when we played Pac-Man, uh, that was a simulated, you know, I don't know, some sort of circle thing that was eating something. We understood that was not real. It was fantasy. And when the ghosts came out to kill us and we died, we knew that that was fantasy. So that's, we all understand that because it doesn't really look human and this sort of thing. Well, with young people today, they're acclimated to this video game world. And some of the games look extremely real. And yet they still look at it the same way that we looked at Pac-Man. They understand that it's not real. And we've done, you know, studies on this sort of thing where you take kids, you play, you know, one or two or three hours a day of extreme violent video games, or they watch violent movies. And you ask them a bunch of questions, you you observe their behavior, you might even show them uh, actual clips of real violence, not, you know, extreme violence, but something like that. And you'll see a very different reaction, not only what they say, but also physiologically. So with that, how how do they not come with that bloodlust yet? Because, like, I remember playing cops and robbers or army men or whatever, and you shoot your friend and they fall down dead or whatever. But it was never anything that showed blood. It was never anything that showed anything. I mean, up here in Canada, the only time you really saw blood was when you're playing hockey and somebody, uh, you know, you're watching a hockey fight on TV or at the hockey rink or something like that. And that was okay because you knew it happened inside the rink in a controlled environment. Whereas with the video games today, the way they perceive everything to be so lifelike and real, isn't that numbing for a child to see that? Apparently not. It, we don't see kids, uh, you know, it, we see a reduction in crime. We see a reduction in violent crime. We see an increase in media attention on particular crimes. Uh, so it, even though we have a lot more violence, uh, shown to kids uh, in movies and TV shows and video games, it doesn't seem to correlate with an increase in violence or murder. Uh, so it's, again, it's hard to know. And like I said, there are individuals who probably uh, are susceptible that, that, you know, they've been abused or they have psychopathic traits and, they uh, become obsessed with these images and it is sort of a, uh, the last straw that pushes them into a direction where they actually start to act on it. So I'm not saying that these images are universally wonderful. The other thing is, is that it's not, so just looking at kids and, and what they view and what they play and looking at uh, them becoming killers themselves, I mean, that's one way of looking at it. But there's other issues, too, like the issue that the child is not being very connected to other people Um, and the fact that they might actually become kind of depressed over time or anxious or lonely or socially awkward. Now, that's a real thing, but that doesn't have anything to do with violent video games. It just has to do with the way our society is set up now, where take a 13-year-old kid, 15-year-old kid who has video games. He's had video games his whole life. He loves video games. He, he knows how to play video games. There's never an awkward moment when he plays his video games in his room on his Xbox with his own TV in his, with his headphones on. Then he goes out, you know, he's like at school and he's like thinking, Oh man, I gotta, I want to ask that girl out on a date. And so he asked her on a date and it's weird and awkward the way it was for every young person in, in history. You go out on a date and it goes badly. And it's horrific and humiliating. You know, she breaks up with you. She laughs in your face or something. And you go back to your room and, you're, and you go to your video game thing and you're like, oh, my video games and my, my Xbox and my TV and, 
it's a safe place and I have entertainment here and I can, uh, I can depend on this. And that's a different situation than when we were young and we had those experiences, we'd run home and there was nothing to do in our bedroom (laughs) except maybe listen to music. And we had to call someone on the phone. We had to go to our parents. We had to um, actually speak to somebody either over the phone or in person. And through that support asking and support giving, it helped us to better our self-esteem, to feel more connected to the world, uh, to be encouraged to try it again. And so if there's a, a, a negative effect of the lifestyles, it, but it doesn't have anything to do with video games. It has to do with, well, it has something to do with video games, obviously, but it has more to do with just the way that we parent kids and the kind of uh, incentives that they have in life and that kind of thing. As ch- children get older and their minds start to form and they're they're starting to be kind of different or being labeled as different in society and they start to pull away, become more introverted. Is this where the mind starts to get darker, where they start to look for revenge on people? Well, to be clear, it's not introversion that causes the problem. It's a sociality. So it's people who uh, retract from uh, others. Uh, Introverts are uh, people who like to uh, connect with other people in small environments. So these are, they're still social people, but they just don't like big crowds, but they definitely like their two or three friends. But asocial or asociality people who just pull away from society. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a massive problem. And I worry, I treated a lot of families uh, going through that. And like I you know, described, it's a vicious cycle because the more you pull away, the less self-esteem you have the more awkward you become, the more your peers, um, you know, sort of grow up socially and have self-esteem in that area. And you just feel awful. And it it just becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. And, you know, the other thing, Dave, is that on the internet, there's, there are communities like the incels or the MGTOW people who will, um, you know, welcome you into their group, which is nice to have a group of friends, but what they start doing is they start feeding a bunch of propaganda about the world is against them. And, and very rarely, but some of those individuals turn to violence. When you look at serial killers like Ted Bundy or Charles Manson, what are some of the traits that are different from say everyday people who are functioning? Maybe they have a mortgage, they have a family, they have children or pets. What's, what's the biggest difference? Again, hard to know because um, I never met them. And uh, from the psychohistories that I've read, uh, there's only so much you can sort of glean from it. But the general thing I'll say is that, um, it, in my opinion, the focus is on their disorganized attachment, meaning that they grew up in a situation in which they felt um, dis- d- detached from other people, either through abuse or just, you know, parenting gone wrong, this kind of thing. And they uh, didn't feel like they could really depend on other people. And they probably also deeply hated themselves in some fundamental level. And when we are faced with that kind of conclusion as a young person, we have a lot of different coping uh, styles available to us. One of which involves believing that you are awesome, believing that you just sort of make up the story when you're quite young, like three, four years old, that you're this golden God and everyone else in the world is worthless. And this is, you know, particularly with Ted Bundy, I think this was true. And he, I, I think Charlie Manson actually, um, well, I think both of them had this. Anyway, the point is, is that you develop a scoping style that you believe that you're really good, but deep down, you know that you're not, you're actually like, the opposite of good, like just the worst of the worst. You're, you're nothing. But if you uphold this surface level, I'm awesome. Then you sort of distract yourself and you need to constantly feed that ego of I'm the best. And so you start to uh, try to prove it by manipulating other people, getting other people to do things. But deep down, 
you're really sad, you're really lonely, and you're really angry. You're extremely angry, and it's this primal anger that goes back to when you were very young. For Ted Bundy, it seemed that in the beginning, he wanted to connect with women. He wanted to connect. He wanted to have a wife, a stable relationship. But because of his difficulties, because it was hard for him to connect with other people, it's hard for him to uh, trust other people, things didn't go well. And, and really, you know, when you're young, he was probably early 20s when, when he was in one significant relationship. She, she dumped him, and it was devastating to him. And he talks about this in his documentary, uh, the, the Ted Bundy tapes, which I recommend people listen to if they want to know more about this. He talks about how just he was – for months, he was just thrown into this state where he just didn't know who he was, and he, he doesn't even really remember it. He was in a lot of distress. Well, during that time, there's no way to soothe the self. These, these sorts of people were mistreated in such a way that they have no way of just reassuring themselves that things are going to be okay, and their distress is, like, so severe. And, I mean, it, the analogy or the, the sort of thing I like to point out is – if you've ever had a young child or you've been around a young child when they're having a meltdown, say they're 18 months, two years old, and they're tired, they're hungry, they're uncomfortable or something, and they just lose it, right? They just, you know, they, they're screaming, they're on the ground, and you know they're in distress. They're not making it up. They're, they're cranky, and they don't know what to do, and they, they just, their whole self just sort of melts down. Well, for those people at that age, it's normal, right? Those people can't soothe themselves. And so they need us as parents to go to them and hold them or ask them what they want or something, or, you know, and say, It'll, everything's going to be okay, or, you know, do, do what we can to soothe them. Well, for people like Ted Bundy, they were treated in such a way that they have a certain arrested development from that time where when something goes bad in their life and they have distress, in, inside of them, they go to that place and they have, it's just unbridled suffering for them. And the thing that perhaps brought him out of that was this notion of revenge. Although he never really admitted to this, so it's, you know, it's just me speculating quite a bit. I think that his brain locked in on, you know, okay, uh, I'm suffering. I've, I have no way out, but at least I can get back at these women or I can get back at this woman who dumped me. And so what he would do is he would find women that looked or resembled or reminded him of her and he would do terrible things to them. And that would, you know, scratch an itch. So again, speculation, but that's my conceptualization of Ted Bundy in a nutshell. I did a, I did like, I don't know, a few hours on him. So it's kind of hard to, in my podcast, kind of hard to summarize really quickly but i don't know does that make sense to you dave absolutely we got about seven minutes here before we get to the top of the hour and the break my question to you is where does the sexual sadism come in because for somebody like ted bundy he loved the power he loved to be able to be in control full control of the entire situation whether it was sexually or whether it was killing how much does sexual hatred come into play? It's really hard to tell. And if Ted Bundy were still alive and I had access to him I, and he was honest with me, I'd, I'd try to, and if I was trying to answer this question, I would really need to answer a lot of questions. I need to ask him a lot of questions. Basically, for some people, sexual you know, rape and um, sexual assault, uh, assaultive behavior can be motivated by just pure power for, for some people, they just want to, they just want to make other people suffer and they just want to be in power over other people. And they could do it by uh, beating them or they could do it by stealing from them or they could do it by assaulting them sexually. So for some people, that's the motivation for other people. They actually have a condition or they develop the condition in which they actually get turned on by raping other people. So we, this is the you know, sexual sadistic personality. And for these people, it's a, uh, you know, in the same way that the vast majority of other people get turned on by uh, typical things, shall we say, 
these people get turned on by uh, uh, images and thoughts and actions of actual rape, which is, uh, you know, quite an unfortunate development in their personality for all of us. How much does pornography play a role in this? Well, similar to video games, pornography for, because most people look at pornography, uh, the, the vast majority of people, pornography doesn't seem to have any negative effects. For some individuals, it seems like who have a lot of other factors that are playing into their sexual issues, pornography can play a role for sure. And similar to video games, uh, that doesn't mean that pornography doesn't have issues because there are lots of other issues like pornography can, uh, if it's done in a very uh, stereotypical way, it can warp the mind, the minds of young people to think that that's what sex is always supposed to look like. And there's a lot of issues like that, but um, in general, porn seems to be fairly safe in the same way that video games are. Cause I thought I had read uh, in Ted Bundy's stories, and there's hundreds and thousands of stories about him that, you know, he, he loved watching porn and it was, an, it was part of his aggression. It was part of what fueled him. Yeah. So again, it's hard to know because he often lied to uh, journalists, but he, later on in his stay on death row, he started to talk about that. And uh, one could say he was just trying to, blame something that was popular in the eighties to blame. But, um, if we're to believe him, yeah, it's, so it's, he was saying it was all the porn, but if we're to include it in the conceptualization I have of him, he could have early in his life had a, the seeds of what would develop later into this aggression and revenge against women that was related to his mom. And, seeing pornography as a younger person could have, you know, planted the seeds in some kind of mixture or some kind of complex in his psychology that um, could have led, you know, to it. Uh, I suspect if he never saw any porn that he would have had issues anyway. Uh, it's just, it's just a guess. Uh, so might it have been one of the factors? Yeah, I could, I could see that. Dr. Kurt Honda is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we are talking about serial killers and the psychology behind them, Dr. Honda, in regards to Ted Bundy and, and the way he he lied and manipulated his way, how much does compulsive lying then come into play? Or is it a matter of building up multiple personalities via the stories that you create? Well, from the conceptualization uh, consensus, he didn't suffer from what we might call multiple personalities or dissociative identity, but uh, the pathological line was absolutely a part of it. So when you're a psychopath like Ted Bundy, you don't really care about other people's feelings. And when other people are hurt or, you know, physically hurt or dead because of you, you don't care. But at a smaller level, you don't even care about disappointing other people. You don't care about other people losing trust in you because you just, you just don't really care. And so when you're growing up uh, and so you and I, I'm going to assume Dave, you're not a psychopath. You don't seem like one to me, <laughs> but I don't know. Oh, good. You don't seem Thank like you. Me. Yeah. <laughs> and so you and I, when we were growing up and we lied to someone because, you know, we we're trying to get away with something and our parents or our friends or someone looked at us with disappointment, you know, and they were, they looked at us, they were angry, they were hurt, they were disappointed. You and I were devastated. You and I would go like, we'd feel ashamed of ourselves because we, we felt the pain of the other person. We could mentalize the other person's pain. They, they tell us they're in pain and we feel it also. You know, we have these mirror neurons where we feel other people's pain. And so in our brains, we're like, okay, lying to people equals pain, not only for other people, but for me too, because I don't, I feel other people's pain and therefore I'm not going to lie again because that was off to the psychopath. They don't have that mechanism. And so it doesn't, uh, there's no, um, there, there's none of that experiential learning that teaches them that lying is bad. So they, they, they just don't have any problem with it. And it, and it just becomes habitual to them because they're trying to, they're always trying to get what they want. 
is that the drive? Is is that what their focus is? Is getting what they want? We got about thirty seconds. So I have an interesting point of view on this. I actually believe that they have the same wants that we do, but it gets completely jumbled up. I think that they actually want attachment with other people, but they have as it filters as that need filters through their personality it becomes completely dysfunctional by the time it actually manifests and on that note dr kirk honda we're going to hop out here and take a break at the top of the hour we have dr kirk honda for one more hour here on spaced out radio i know there's a few questions tonight we are talking about the psychology of serial killers Our guest tonight is Dr. Kirk Honda. He is out of Seattle, Washington, has a great podcast that you might want to check out called the Psychology in Seattle podcast. It can be found on iTunes and a number of other places. Kirk, welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Now, right before the break, we were talking about the mind, like with somebody like Ted Bundy, who murdered dozens of women. And this was a gentleman who really changed his identity, changed his his look. A very, very, very sadistic sociopath. I think that's a fair comment to make on him. When you or look at somebody like him, the way he almost had a, a hunger to kill women, how does one get that hunger how does how does that work in the mind have you ever been able to figure that out or is there any studies that have been able to talk to some of these serial killers that maybe haven't been executed or while they're alive talk to them about it on how they just have no feeling or regard for humanity and human life to do what they are doing yeah it's a excellent question um one that is i think central to our interest in such figures the other question that I'll have, so I'll answer your question with a question, which is a typical therapist sort of thing. What sort of shoes are you wearing right now or footwear? I'm barefoot right now. Okay. Why are you barefoot right now? I what find about your that psychology made you, you know, barefoot right now? I feel more comfortable without shoes and socks on. Okay. So, good. Why do you feel more comfortable without shoes or socks on? That's a good question. It's hard to know, right? It's like, well, I don't know. I just like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of things like that. Why do some people like Star Wars and some people hate it? Why do some people become accountants and some people become broadcasters? We can look at factors like, well, I don't know. I was sort of influenced here, but we really just don't know. We don't know the answer to that question because there's there's no way to answer it. We can answer scientific questions like, how much does the moon weigh? You know, uh, how long is a day? How big, is, how far are we to the sun? There are ways of measuring those things. There, you know, you have a scientific question we can answer. When we have a question, why does Ted Bundy uh, have the urge to kill the way that he did? We can expand that to all human behaviors. Why do some people wear, you know, fashionable clothes and some people just don't seem to care? We have explanations for it. You know, it's not like, like you had an explanation. It's like, well, I don't know. I just, it just feels better when I'm not wearing shoes. We have to go by that. So you go to a serial serial killer. It's like, why do you do this? You know? And they'll be like, it just feels good. They, I like to do it. So that's about as far as we can go in terms of uh, hard science. But when it comes to softer sciences, uh, psychology being uh, uh, in large part, a softer science, then we can start making some conceptualizations of it. We can start thinking about, well, what are the commonalities among these people? And what is the precipitance? What's the the full picture of the motivation? And like I said, for Ted, and I think it's different for different serial killers. And uh, like Jeffrey Dahmer, for example, he was a different sort of killer than Ted Bundy. And like Jeffrey Dahmer, I think, you know, I did a, deep dive on him on my podcast as well but i think he was more motivated by just really wanting to be close to somebody you know when he would kill people he would cut up their bodies and he would stay with them you know he would hold them he you know the the stories you hear about are he would have body parts in the fridge 
when they would interview him and he would talk about how it was his way of trying to hold on to these people because he didn't feel worthy enough to uh, actually have a relationship with somebody match that up with psychopathy in that he doesn't really care about humans the way that other people do. That's a different kind of a path of a path of wanting to hold uh, Ted, Ted Bundy, I think also had a uh, need to be close to people, but was also extremely angry. The man was angry to the point of, of obsession and self-destruction. You know, he escaped twice, right? Uh, one in particular time, he made it all the way across the United States down to Florida and then proceeded to self-destruct one night by walking into a sorority or a, a college dorm with a bunch of young women and assaulted many of them and killed some of them. And, and that was very different than the things he used to do before where he would actually kind of methodically lure people and get away with it. And this one, it was very sloppy and he got caught pretty quickly. So, you know, we can conceptualize it as a, as a anger issue that's wrapped up in this um, notion, you know, when you and I get angry at somebody, we have a lot of ways of expressing it that are functional. We can, you know, the, I don't know, what do you, like say you're at work or, you know, you're at the store and someone bothers you and you come home, what do you do with your anger, Dave? Usually, I will give myself a timeout. I used to be very loud and verbal. And and I remember one time when my daughter was probably about five years old, the loudness of my voice scared her. And seeing the, that fear in her eyes that's where I made a commitment to myself that, yeah, I'm not going to be like my dad in regards to, you know, having that loud voice. And I would just usually just kind of button up and go give myself a, a time out, so to speak, in my own room, give myself whether it was 10 minutes or whether it was three hours to calm myself down because I didn't want to be that way in front of my kids. Okay, good for you. What if it was something that, kind of stayed on your mind that uh, stick what stuck with you for a few days. So, you know, you get over the initial blast of fight or flight response. What do you do after that with your anger? I would be, I would say I'm pretty much like the rest of society and I suppress it. Okay. I mean, do you ever talk about it? Do you ever say something to someone like I'm pissed up? Yeah. Right. So I heard four things. One is when you get angry, you might uh, just start screaming, (laughs) right? You're at home and you're just like, Oh my God, I can't stand what's happening right now. Okay. So although that's, you know, great that you can identify that it's not healthy and you, you don't want to do that anymore. That's healthier than what Ted Bundy did, right? <laughs> what yes. Ted Bundy did was he felt like he couldn't even really do that. So the, uh, so the anger builds in someone, the hurt, the deep sense and, and the level of anger is so much higher. So he's deeply hurt. He's, he feels deeply worthless. He's, you know, he has years and years of anger built up and he doesn't have the procedures that other people have where you can scream about it, or you can take a time out or you can suppress it even, or you can talk about it with someone else because he didn't trust other people. Plus he was so narcissistic that he didn't want to come across as weak to other people. And so he did his best to appear to everyone else like everything was fine. It, it was his way of trying to retain the veil that everything was okay, which made him feel okay. If he, made, if he gave this impression that everything was okay, he too felt okay. And so all this roiling, just anger and revenge had nowhere else to go. And for him, it resulted in what he did for other, for the the vast majority of other people in that situation, they, they drink a lot or they smoke pot a lot or some other kind of vice is usually what they turn to. So for him or any other serial killer in that regard, 
we in the media, like if you're watching a documentary, you always hear this this infamous saying called bloodlust. Did it have anything to do with bloodlust? Hard to know. That's not my conceptualization. I mean, it's hard to know what people exactly mean by that. Like they get addicted to blood or something. Um, uh, that's not my conceptualization of these people. Certainly it can become a compulsion, uh, in the same way that, uh, you have an itch on your leg and you have to itch it, or you need a cigarette every once in a while and the, the motivation builds in you or yet you you want to have sex or you want food or whatever sort of motivation that sort of builds over time. Uh, Ted Bundy seemed to actually have that. Uh, a lot of serial killers seem to have that. So we can conceptualize it compulsively, um, but in terms of bloodlust, like, you know, the, the cougar gets the taste for blood and it's a man killer. I think that's from movies. And Hollywood does have a good way of trying to build the drama. So that's what you chalk it up to. Yeah, I think so. And in plus, as I don't know if you can uh, relate to this, but the way I see Ted Bundy and other serial killers um, uh, is particular and uh, other people share my point of view, but it's not the majority in society for sure. It involves uh, seeing these people as suffering human beings and uh, which I deeply believe. And there's a lot of evidence for that. And what some people uh, sort of mistake that for is sympathy for them and their behavior or something. I have no sympathy for Ted Bundy. Lots of people have issues and he decided to hurt other people. That is awful. He's responsible for that. Um, he's an awful human being, but he also was suffering greatly. And that's just not a very interesting story to society. We like vampires and Darth Vader. Well, I guess Darth Vader eventually became someone who was suffering, but we like vampires, you know, evil creatures, the creature from the, Black Lagoon. Um, well, it wasn't a creature for, I'm using a lot of bad metaphors right now, <laughs> but we like our That's evil characters. Okay. And, I, <clears throat> and I think uh, for serial killers, they, uh, ex they um, can be that sort of character to us in our society. I got a few questions from our audience here. If you don't mind in the chat rooms, I'd like to read to you. Quest is asking somebody like Richard Ramirez. Do you believe even from a scientific view, that he could have been demonically possessed. I don't know who Richard Ramirez was, but I... The Night Stalker. My, okay, well, uh, was Richard Ramirez a serial killer? Yes. Yeah. In California. So, I personally don't conceptualize people uh, in such a way, but other people are free to, to do that. But uh, I find that there are perfectly, well, within the field of psychology there's a lot of explanations for why people do this that don't include such conceptualizations i don't know does that make sense absolutely sharon is wondering hi sharon from arkansas i'm dave from bc she is wondering why are there more men than female serial killers that's a very good question it's hard to know like i said but my conceptualization which is shared by some others is that one, men are socialized to be more aggressive when we're, when we're young, when we're, you know, even as young as six months old, little boys are treated differently than little girls. When a boy is, for example, they've studied this, when a boy is more violent, uh, more aggressive, even at the age of six, nine, 12 months, parents are much more lenient. When a little girl is aggressive, uh, the parents are much more likely to stop them, stop the young girl from doing that. So boys are socialized to be that way. Um, two, boys are socialized to not ask for help and to not ask for love in general. Uh, boys are socialized to be tough and to be independent and to be successful. And uh, girls are at least somewhat more allowed to do that kind of thing. So you have a bunch of boys who have a lot of issues and suffering and they have no way of asking for that. And that can create a lot of issues where you turn to aggression to solve your problems. Uh, and we see that in society for sure. And, and that absolutely, in my opinion, can be a factor in 
why you see more men as serial killers. The other thing is, is probably biology plays a role. It's hard to know, given that we socialize our kids in different ways and society socializes as socializes us as we grow up in different ways. But it seems that biology might play a role. Uh, testosterone plays a role in aggression and those kinds of things. So um, there's probably other factors that I'm not remembering, but, and also women are socialized to believe that when there's something wrong, there's something wrong with them in general. And so women tend to internalize their pain and blame themselves. Whereas men tend to blame other people. That's maybe another factor. Sexuality can be sometimes different between men and women and can produce the sorts of things that rape. Having said that, uh, there are women serial killers and there are women race rapists for sure. So it's not, it's not, a, it's like a, you know, it's a percentage thing. Interesting. I never would have thought about that. So with somebody, and I'm not sure if you recognize the name of Eileen Wernos, who was the first, I believe, female serial killer in the modern era to be executed. I th- believe she killed like seven or 10 men, something along those lines. How much does anger have to play in this? Like when you, uh, when we talked earlier about getting angry and about me or any of us, when we get angry, we, we, we learn how to control that anger to the best of our abilities. And yet, this rage that the many of these serial killers take out on the bodies, whether it is dissecting them, cutting them up, eating them like Dahmer did, or, you know, cutting off certain body parts like Eileen Wernos did. Does that type of rage come from within or do they not know how to control that anger that they are feeling at that time? That's a sound conceptualization that for most people when they're angry and, and again, the anger comes from somewhere. So we're typically angry because uh, people have rejected us or uh, hurt us in some way, emotionally usually. And so that's where it begins. And then we get angry about it because we want to uh, tell other people to stop it. That's the impulse of, of anger. It's a way of asserting our needs, a way of communicating to other people that they've hurt us. Now, if you have been mistreated or there's been some issue that's led to some different sort of developmental, uh, you know, factors in your personality, you don't believe the way that you and I believe uh, that if we communicate our anger, people will respond well. You know, when I'm angry, I uh, talk to my wife and I'm just like, I'm angry about this thing that happened and it bothers me. And I know that she'll, Uh, respond well. Or if I'm angry at her, if she hurts my feelings, I know I can tell her uh, that she hurt my feelings or that I'm angry at her. And in general, I trust that she'll respond well to that. For some people, given the way that they're raised, they absolutely do not believe that to their core. Even if you prove it to them that you're there, they actually are so distrustful of other people in general that um, they gave up a long time ago on people. Now, I'm painting a wide swath to every serial killer, by the way, which is impossible. Like you brought, you actually brought up Jeffrey Dahmer. I actually believe that he was, anger was not his primary reason. Uh, I, like I said, I think it was this uh, psychopathy matched up with this deep desire to be close to somebody. And, uh, but he, he seemingly had no self-esteem to uh, believe that anyone would actually like him for who he was. And I I think that it became this very weird, you know, it's sort of like if you want to be close to your uh, idol in hockey, for example, you might, if they, if, if they, if you were at a hockey uh, match and they gave you their stick, um, you would hold on to that and you would bring it home and you'd say, yes, I have a trophy. You can also listen to the show live there. The Gavinator will have more features for you very, very soon. You know, we got to give a little shout out to the Gavinator tonight. He was planning on getting a bunch of work done on the site today. But unfortunately, his day got bad. He had to put his puppy down of 16 years. 
16 years with a dog and he had to put it down. And uh, so he, he wasn't feeling too up to it. So we gave him a day off today, obviously. So thoughts and prayers with Gavinator and his family tonight. Also, we want to give a shout out to Gene in D.C. Hi, Gene. Do us a favor. Give us a call sometime. Thank you so much for listening in. Dr. Kirk Honda is our guest tonight out of Seattle, Washington. He is a psychologist. We're looking into the psychology of serial killers. He has a podcast called the Psychology in Seattle podcast, which you can find on iTunes as well as other locations. Dr. Honda, welcome back to the show. Thanks. I'm really sorry to hear about your colleague's dog. That is yeah. truly awful. Yeah, it's terrible. Absolutely terrible. Yeah, he, he was kind of down. I talked to him about an hour before the show, and he was like, yeah, man. He, I said, How, how'd the website go today? Are we having any pages up today like you promised? He's like, yeah, about that. He goes, I had to put my dog down today. I'm like, oh, well, that's not good. So we talked for like about half an hour. You know, just let them spill it out a little bit. But 16 years, that's, yeah. a, you know, you know what sucks about dogs? And I, I'm a huge dog lover. I got three dogs. You know, we're just not blessed with enough time with them. I know. It is, it truly is. Uh, cats as well. A lot yeah. of pets. They, they live so short. And, uh, you know, it, I, I've lost a number of pets in my life that, you know, were very, very dear to me. And now whenever I get a new animal in my life, I think, well, you know, start the clock because eventually if things go according to normalcy, I'm going to lose this, this animal and not too long from now. And that's going to be devastating. I know. I know. It's just amazing that you can find an animal like a dog and even some cats. Yeah, that we give cats a hard time for being cranky all the time. But, you know, especially dogs. You know, like, I haven't had a dog ever last more than 10 years or nine years, just over nine years. I've never had that 10-year dog. And I look at my three dogs, and one is nine, one is eight, and the other one we think is seven or eight. And I just think, damn, you know, like what, what's going to be happening here in the next year to two years? Like this sucks. Now you start thinking about it and dogs are just way too kind for the most part. They're just way too kind. And we deserve to have them a little bit longer than what we do. It's not fair, not fair at all, but that's for an entirely different conversation. My friend, that one's just going to upset me and piss me off, but Back to serial killers. Let's get to it. And I should let our audience know that, you you know, originally we we're only going to have you until the top of the hour, but you're going to go till 1130 because you're having fun and the audience is really enjoying you as well. So thank you for extending your time with us. Now, in regards to, you know, right before we talked about female serial killers and the anger and, you know, is there anger differences between the two? When you look at somebody like Charles Manson, who was, I would say, a master manipulator in regards to using religious doctrine in order to build his conclave, if we want to call it that, how does that type of psychology work where somebody is literally able to control the minds of other people? Yeah, he's an interesting case, and the followers are also interesting, the Manson family, as they call themselves. He was uh, similar to someone like Ted Bundy, but had a a different style of, of coping with the emptiness inside, which was to control other people, to, uh, to get them to believe he was some sort of guru. For many years before he uh, killed anybody, he fashioned him. He wanted to be a musician. He wanted to be a, a like he loved the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. He wanted to be um, famous. He wanted to be a rock star. He wanted that accolade of screaming women and the power and the money And, you know, a lot of people want that. He, on the other hand, had nothing to fall back on. I wanted to be a rock star when I was a kid. I loved the Beatles. I loved, 
you know, the cure and other kinds of bands. And when I was 18, I wanted to be a rock star. And when that quickly, when I quit, when I realized that was um, never going to happen pretty quickly in my adult life, I had other things to fall back on and I had self-esteem. I could fall back on. I'd be like, well, even though I'm not a rock star, um, you know, I still think I'm a worthy human being on this planet. I'm sure I'll figure something out for people like Charles Manson. They don't have that uh, sense of self that they can fall back on. And so they keep going towards uh, building uh, something. So when it didn't work out for, it almost worked out with him on a rock star. He got the beach boys to record his music and all that kind of stuff. But uh, that wasn't going very far and he needed to turn to something else. So that's when he actually turned to building a, like a commune thing where he was going to be the leader of a, a little cult group. And when that sort of uh, started to become not so interesting to him, then he wanted to change the world. He wanted to start the revolution. And uh, that's what led to the killing. So with somebody like Charles Manson, was it years and years of brainwashing people to his indoctrination? Or was it the fact that he was looking for certain types of people who were maybe destitute and had no passion or desire to live until they found him and his kind words? I don't think he was smart enough or had the resources to make such a plan. He, uh, from this, the stories that I've heard about, you know, what builds up to the family was he was, it was pretty haphazard. He was a uh, charismatic fellow. He had these, these piercing eyes and he loved to play his guitar and sing his songs. And at the time, a lot of people were, uh, the hippie movement was on and people were yes. hitchhiking to California and they were, look, people were looking for groups of people to hang out with. Again, no video games, not much on TV. And you, there were a lot of kids, a lot of young adults just hanging out on the beach and at the park. And there was this notion in the culture at the time around gurus, around uh, teachers who would bring people together, Timothy Leary and uh, Buddhist gurus and, or, you know, uh, Buddhist leaders and other kinds of uh, thinkers who would, you know, build a group around them. And it was seen as a good thing. Today, we kind of look back at it as a little dubious, but at the time, it was something that a lot of people were receptive, were, you know, looking for, kind of. And from what I understand from the story, and I, I could be wrong because I'm not a super expert on Charles Manson, but he uh, just start because of his narcissism, he just started to talk like he was a leader, and he started to gather people around him. And that made him feel good. That filled the void temporarily for him that he so desperately needed to fill. Mm-hmm. Yet he didn't do any of the killing himself. He was able to manipulate these people to enact his own rage and his own manifesto. It was almost like building an army. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the story leading up to the actual killings is interesting because, uh, and again, I'm sure there are people listening right now who are actually much more expert on this than I am. But from my memory, there there was uh, drug dealing involved, and there was a drug deal that went wrong, and they kidnapped a guy, some guy involved in drugs, and it it was a weird meandering path to what he eventually landed on, which was he wanted to start the revolution in. Uh, the United States, uh, the, the uprising of black people. And although when we look back, it seems like this really silly thing, right? It's like, what, you know, but if you lived in the time, there was a very real, uh, I don't know, worry or potentiality of a rebellion among young people because, you know, the riots and, and the uh, protests and there were, uh, there was domestic terrorism that was pretty rampant in the late 60s and early 70s. And 
there was a real threat. And so he thought, and it wasn't completely irrational, that if he started the ball rolling, that the revolution would happen and he would be hailed as like the king of the revolution. Again, more of that, um, more of that narcissism. So I don't think he actually set out to like, okay, I'm going to build an army and I want to kill people. I think he, he just wanted to be great. And he was a psychopath who was quite disturbed and wasn't um, afraid or wouldn't shy away from killing people in the process. But the, the interesting question is, what if he actually did become famous as a musician? Because a lot of people think that if he did, he never would have done any of those things because he would have been fulfilled. You know, what if Hitler had become a famous painter? You know, there's these questions of, uh, you know, what if? So with a person like Manson, the way he was able to control, how do you convince people that starting a revolution or starting uh, a revolution with a violent act such as that and then blaming it on a different race. I mean, that just screams psycho- psy- uh, psychopathic behavior. And yet these people were so indoctrinated that, that they followed. And I, I guess I'm having trouble trying to figure out why anybody would do that. Because if I'm hanging out with somebody and they seem really cool, and, and let's face it, there's alpha people and there's beta people, and... If they are that alpha to try and control me to say, hey, you know, I want you to go rob that person or I want you to kill this person. I'm just looking at them and saying, I'm out. I'm out. Right. Yeah. So that's another interesting question that I think all of us have when we see cases like this. You know, we look at a case like Charlie Manson, like, okay, sure, there are some bad apples. But what about all those other people? How did how did he convince those other people? And. The process is well-documented and happens in a lot of contexts. We actually, this is, we don't have a lot of data on serial killers, but we have a lot of data on um, high influence and um, highly restrictive controlling relationships and what it does to the psychology. So uh, lots of spouses who are in abusive relationships, for example, will exhibit psychology or beliefs, attitudes, behaviors related to this, where you Stockholm syndrome is what we call it, right? When you are in a high control situation and you feel like you can't really get out and the dominant charismatic leader uh, breaks you down over time, it's just easier to hand your mind over to them because you'll be safe. you like, say uh, you're a young woman and you have some self-esteem issues, but, you know, you're, you're doing okay. And you meet a fella, and you fall in love, and things are going okay. And then you get married. You start having kids. And, yeah, sure, he has some anger issues sometimes, but, you know, you can forgive that. But over time, he starts drinking, gets more angry. He lashes out more. When you don't please him in some way, he can sometimes really lose it and beat you you know, badly with bruises and blood and stuff. And you say to yourself, okay, I need to get out of this. I, this is bad. I need this to stop. But he is capable of, I, I'm worried he's going to kill someone with his anger. So if I even suggest a divorce, is he going to kill my kids? Is he going to kill me? It, I, he lies sometimes. Is he going to lie about me? Is he going to stalk me the rest of my life? And it's, so you just repeat that dilemma for days, weeks, months, years. And eventually when you feel trapped, you think, well, I do have a way out of this, which is I can just believe what the dominant person believes. I could just hand my psychology over to them. This is all unconscious, by the way. And everything will be okay because if I hand it over to them, then they will uh, treat me better and I'll be safer. Uh, Things will be okay. If I just sort of let go of myself and I let go of my own needs and I just suppress all those things, then my life will actually go better. To let go of the self means I'm safer. So with 
the Charlie Manson family, again, some of your listeners might be super experts on this and much more knowledgeable about it, but from my memory, he started slow. He would, uh, like, actually, there's this one example that I think typifies it. So in the Beach Boys, there were a number of brothers, the Wilson brothers, right? And yes. he, be, he became friends with the drummer. And the drummer was uh, susceptible to Charlie Manson's charisma and to his control. But, um, oh, sorry, not one of the brothers, but the cousin, uh, the guy who always wears the hat. <laughs> um, he went to a party one, where Charlie Manson was. And the drummer of the Beach Boys is like, oh, you got to meet this guy. He's great. He's a songwriter. He's really interesting. And this other guy in the Beach Boys meets Charlie Manson. And uh, he's just like, oh, hey, great. Nice to meet you. And Charlie Manson did something to him, something aggressive, some, you know, something mildly bullish. And this other Beach Boy was like, whoa, what was that? And said, I don't like this guy. I'm, gonna, I'm not hanging out with this guy. And he ran. So what Charlie Manson probably learned at some point was when he meets someone, he has to test them to see where their self-esteem is and by being aggressive, being hostile, or being controlling in some way. And those people who run away, well, he's never going to be able to control them, and so he, he, that's good that they're running away from. But the people who stay, he knows they have the sort of personality that can be broken down. When they come to him, they're – like I said, they just have a slight self-esteem problem or that, you know, a slight issue. But over time he would, you know, he would start with, um, I need you to, I mean, this is just an example of cult charisma. This isn't necessarily Charlie Manson, but they would say, um, I want you to stop talking to your parents because your parents are a bad influence on you. Okay. You know, if you're not particularly close to your parents, it's not a big deal. I could do without talking to my parents for a couple months. Okay. Um, okay, now you're going you're gonna to dress a different way. Okay, not a big deal. I can dress a certain way. Okay, now you're going to eat a certain way. Okay, I guess so. Okay, now you're going to get this tattoo. Okay, now you're going to kill people. You know, it's a, it's a very slow progression. You know, I took a leap to the kill people, but I hope you get my point. That there's yes. a, a slow breakdown of the individual self where the high control person just takes over. Wouldn't that kind of be like the military with their drill sergeants and basic training? Yeah, I mean, that's akin to it. Of course, uh, one would argue they don't take it as far. But the, you know, when you have a, when you're very concentrating on your own needs and you're very concentrating on the self, it doesn't make you an effective soldier on the battlefield. True. True that. According to the we military. got. We got about a minute 40 here before we got to go to break here at the top of the hour. And I'm going to get to Renee's question here. We can carry this one over after the break if, if you feel a need. And she is asking, what perplexes her is how women and some men tend to write and fall in love with these creeps. Dr. Honda, do you have a possible explanation for this? So when some people are raised, they are made to feel like they are not worth anything. And the way, one way of coping with that is to believe that you are in fact worthless and that other people are good and that your road to safety and security is through other people. And when taken to an extreme or in a particular way, you can look for, a, you know, if you're a young woman and you feel worthless on the inside, you can look for a strong male to, to lead you and protect you and keep you safe. And it, but you need them to be very strong. You need them not to uh, be wishy-washy, so to speak, or to ask you what you want. You need them to be definitive. Well, another word for, you know, very strong and definitive and uh, independent is uh, abusive someone who doesn't care about your feelings, someone who does whatever they want and doesn't really ask you what you want. And so in the beginning, they're falling in love with strength and security, but it's in the end abusive. That's a good time right there. Right there. You timed it out perfectly. 
Dr. Kirk Honda is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He is going to stick around for another 30 minutes. We're going to get our questions in. Tonight, for the final time, we introduce Dr. Kirk Honda. We are talking about the psychology of serial killers. And I know we have some questions in our audience chat rooms tonight, but Dr. Honda, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I want to get a follow-up question in from Renee. This leads to her question right before the break about, you know, people who write into these serial killers and fall in love with them while they're in prison, almost like they are some sort of celebrity. Renee's follow-up question is, how can they possibly protect themselves in prison? Many women go gaga over these inmates. Yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon. I think... Again, I have never studied these people, but I would speculate there's a few motivations. One, I think, is just fame. I think some people, women and men, will do a lot to get fame and recognition. Uh, people will go on Jerry Springer and uh, act like fools and uh, that kind of thing for just a little bit of fame, a little bit of money. And if you marry Charlie Manson in prison, you know you're going to be famous. You also know you're never going to see him in the real world because you know that he's in prison for life. So I think some people are actually motivated by fame. The other possibility that I'll allow is that some people might legitimately like these people. They're often portrayed as these monsters, but for the most part, they're kind, regular people. (laughs) <laughs> who, uh, you know, there's a pot for every lid, so to speak. And there are, uh, you know, elements of their personalities that are probably uh, tolerable, if not appealing to some people. So I'll allow that some people actually legitimately just like them. I think there's got to be something different about someone's personality when they don't date in the real world very well and they turn to inmates who they know are going to be in prison for a long time and who know are infamous for horrible acts. I I imagine that for some of them, again, just all speculation that they might also just not feel like they can actually uh, get a partner in the real world. And they uh, wonder if a, you know, someone in prison would be just more appreciative of them and therefore they would have a more secure relationship with that person. I also think some people are just fascinated with murderers. There's just something about our society that, um, I mean, we're talking about it right now, right? Uh, There's just something about our society where um, it's just really interesting to us. And I think that can be, say, a version of love and affection that could build into actually reaching out and, having a relationship with someone in prison like this. I can see that because like, even with our audience here, our audience really can appreciate the true crime. It it intrigues them. It makes their mind think, you know, I think if you're listening to any type of alternative programming, whether it's about serial killers or, or true crime or aliens and UFOs or, or even politics for that matter, it's that alternative thinking of maybe the conspiracy behind it or, or the mind that just makes people wonder if, if this is, you know, something they're missing out on society that we aren't discussing enough. And another factor in addition to that is, this is, again, just the way I see the world, is all of us, when we were young, had anger and uh, aggression. All of us, from you know, the time we can uh, swing a very weak fist at someone when we're six months old. And we learn through good parenting and society that we can't be aggressive and murderous towards other people, even though we might have those urges at times. And so we suppress, which is a good thing on some level, or we don't allow us ourselves the the pleasure or the satisfaction of punching our boss in the face or um, running someone over that that bothers us. So we live in this uh, tension of denying ourselves something, an impulse that we have. And it's good that we deny ourselves that impulse. But serial killers in our minds 
do not suppress that. And so when we have a lot of suppressed anger and a lot of suppressed aggression towards other people, it's satisfying through sublimation to pay attention and really uh, absorb all the details of these people's lives because we look at them and we say, well, at least, you know, we sort of live vicariously through them. It's like, well, they're, they're getting their aggression. It's the same with like mob movies. You know, why do we love mob movies like Sopranos or uh, Goodfellas so much? It's because partially these people can live outside the law and can actually take those aggressive acts. And we get a satisfaction from seeing people actually do that because we live through them. Interesting. So when it comes to somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer, where it's almost completely different than what other serial killers are dealing with in regards to their own mentality and their strength, where he was more killing out of, and I hate to use this word, compassion for his own needs. Do we look at the fact that there are different breakdowns of how somebody's mind works in regards to taking the lives of innocent others? I think so. I think there's a lot of paths. Now, don't get me wrong. Jeffrey Dahmer absolutely was a psychopath. Uh, Absolutely did not have uh, empathy for other people in the way that most people would. Um, Absolutely had a fascination with um, killing people. He had fantasies of killing people in the same way that I'm sure Ted Bundy did. Uh, But what was different about him was that uh, the way he went about his killings was, like I said earlier, uh, in my conceptualization, an attempt to uh, have a close relationship. He, after he would kill them, he would cuddle with them and he would, you know, have sex with them and he would uh, talk to them. And he felt like they were roommates, so to speak. And uh, it, it gave him comfort because in all likelihood, he believed deep down that no one would actually love him. Now, another factor in Jeffrey Dahmer's uh, life, I was just looking at my notes uh, during the break, is that when he was very young, one, he was he had a parents that weren't uh, very close. There was a lot of conflict, and it seems that he probably had some biological disposition for psychopathy, um, maybe from his mother, hard to say. Um, But he went through this experience early in his life where he had um, a lot of uh, problems with health. And he had surgery for a hernia when he was about three years old. And it was uh, quite gruesome. It was very difficult for him. So, you know, imagine you're three and you have to have your body cut open and you have to go to the hospital and you have to. Uh, leave the comfort of your parents and, and your home and how traumatizing that could be depending on the way it's handled and depending on the way it's dealt with by the individual. And I think that played a role again, just speculation is hard to know, but after that he started to uh, cut open dead animal bodies. Um, and he start then he started having fantasies of cutting open humans and, but, and then he started having fantasies of wanting to kill his parents because his parents were quite conflictual and distant from him and, you know, not a secure base for him. And then that eventually led to his serial killing behavior. So when you look at the way he killed and the way he picked his victims, obviously he was homosexual. He was somebody who was attracted to African-American men. And the way he chose his victims, you know, he looked like somebody who was innocent. He didn't look like he had military background in training because he did spend time in the military. He looked like somebody who was nerdy and weak and not a threat at all. Was that part of his persona or was that part of the image he portrayed? I think that was part of who he was. Uh hard to tell, but you know, the accounts of him growing up was he was quite meek and forgettable and awkward and uh, didn't seem threatening at all to people. So I think, I think that was part of who he was. I, I don't think he was the sort of a person like Ted Bundy who could act in a way to get people to like him. I don't think Jeffrey Dahmer had that ability to charm people into liking him. 
um, he had other aspects of psychopathy. Was he able to turn it off and on, or once you get started, does it become like fentanyl or heroin where you just can't stop? You need that high and that rush of taking someone's life. Uh, that's a, one way of looking at it for sure. And a lot of serial killers will talk about it that way, that it becomes uh, a, this exhilarating experience the first few times they do it. But the, uh, the effect wears off and they have to do it again. And you'll see in the similar way that uh, an alcoholic will have just one drink and then a month later they'll have uh, three drinks and a month later they'll have 10 drinks and assume they're drinking every day. Some serial killers have, and some people who serial rapists and other kinds of serial uh, assaults of people will uh, exhibit that kind of pattern. Well, they'll, they'll have an itch to do it. They'll restrain themselves from doing it. They'll finally do it. And then they'll say, okay, that's it. I'm, that's just one time. I'm never going to do it again the itch will build in them again. They'll do it again. And then they just, it just increases from there. So yeah, that's a way of looking at it for sure. Can it be classified as an addiction? It can be classified as compulsive. Uh, I, I wouldn't use the word addiction because that has a lot of different meanings, but compulsive. Absolutely. Question coming from Nikki in the chat room here. What is the psychology of two serial killers that work together? Is it a situation where there is a dominant person and a type of underling where one feeds off of the other in some way? Well, the one that pops into my head are the, the older fella and the younger fella who uh, killed people from their car with a sniper rifle. Do you remember these people? I do. That was in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, and there was definitely a dominant person in that group. The older fella was absolutely dominant, and the younger person probably never would have done that. In the same way that the Columbine killers, there's, there seems to be a dominant person while the, the other person was uh, seemingly not likely to do that. Uh, the Slender Man murders, if people are familiar with that, there seemed to be a dominant person and a person who was uh, a follower. You know, those kinds of cases are interesting because, you know, one way of looking at it is, well, the dominant person would have done it and they just needed a, an assistant, so to speak. But another way of looking at it is the two people often create this little world where they believe it's us versus them. And it, it's possible that if those two people had different sorts of friends, that they never would have done it, that there was something about the way these two people came together that uh, bred this way of thinking that eventually led to murderous behavior. So really, two people could feed off their energy then, even though one is dominant. Yeah. Yeah. And as a clinician, I've seen this uh, before, not in murderers, but in uh, enmeshed friendships where you have a, uh, I can think of years ago working with a, a teen girl who was quite sad, quite depressed and quite alienated, felt uh, like she was, she hated her parents and she just felt like the world was against her. And felt really bad and was a little lonely and she was really desperate for a friend and was really often looking for friends. She's would try to have a boyfriend and things wouldn't work out. But then she finally found a best friend, someone who she could really meld with and they became inseparable. And although that's great, it's great to have a friend, but the way they built the friendship was against the world, you know, against their families in a way, you could say it became like a two-person little cult, in a sense, where they had their own language, they had their own belief system. They, um, if they, if either one of them was nice to anyone else, it felt like a threat to their relationship. And absolutely, that I mean, so the vast majority of those cases don't end up killing anyone, but it can become an issue because all their other relationships fall away which can 
um, you know, be harmful to the individuals in the long run. Hmm. What about somebody like the Zodiac Killer? Now, PBR is asking this question in the chat room. Now, there's somebody down in San Francisco who has never been caught. The code has never been broken. Their victims were never the same. Could have been male, could have been female, old, young. It really didn't seem to matter. When you have somebody like that who has almost made a game out of it, where does that fall in the line of psychology in trying to decipher what this human being is all about. Yeah, that's a tough one. I haven't studied him or her, but I, uh, from my limited understanding of the details, it's so clearly a psychopath, clearly a sadistic person, possibly someone who actually has something against society in general and also authority and the police, because from my memory of the story, uh, which is mainly from Zodiac, the movie, <laughs> which is a great David Fincher movie. Um, he took pleasure in messing with the police officers on some level and the press. And so that would make you feel powerful. It'd make you feel superior. It'd make you feel like you're getting revenge on everyone for some sort of harm you felt like people did to you. So, yeah, I think there is a different flavor to that sort of killing. But in all likelihood, that individual has th- the same basic issues as Ted Bundy and Dahmer and everyone else, which is um, lack of empathy, urges to hurt other people, um, an inability to soothe one's emotions, that kind of thing. So when somebody like the, the Zodiac killer goes around with absolutely no compassion, is that something that is a, a person who has absolutely no regard for anything in society outside of their own narcissism, or does it go beyond being narcissistic? Well, absolutely. Their narcissism uh, is a big part of it. They think they're you know, very much concerned with themselves, and they believe that they're better than other people. Uh, Ted Bundy and the Zodiac, uh, particularly Ted Bundy, because we can study him because we actually have interviews with him and maybe the Zodiac killer. It's hard. It's really hard to tell the Zodiac is like, you know, who knows what's going on in their mind. But with Ted Bundy, absolutely. He believed he was, he was the, you know, the best person on the planet and he could defend himself in court and he was the smartest guy in the room and uh, to his own detriment. So with this guy who, or woman, we believe it's a man who has never been caught. How does one stay on the lam like that? How does one stay away from police? Are they trying to calculate how to stay free so they can continue their lust of what they are doing? Or in the case of somebody like Ted Bundy, where he eventually, his emotions got the better of him, he screwed up, if we can use that term, which it, we're glad he did. Like, do they have control of that? Do they have that type of strong mindset? Because that takes a lot of discipline. Yeah, it's possible that with the Zodiac Killer, well, one, he could have died, right? Uh, The other possibility is that uh, he somehow was able to get on top of his urges. The other possibility is he he never really had the urge to kill in the same way that other people did. He might have done it more in a more calculated way. In a, in a way that he didn't actually, ha- you know, Ted Bundy had the itch. Jeffrey Dahmer had an itch that they had to scratch, like a compulsion. But it's possible that the Zodiac Killer wasn't like that. And so when the heat got too hot, he stopped. The other thing is that when you give people long enough in general, they tend to become less symptomatic over time. So people who are psychopathic and have, you know, a lot of problematic behaviors at the age of 25, over time, they tend to mellow out. It's, it's just something that you see in general in people. So it's possible that the Zodiac Killer just got old and mellowed out. On that note, we got less than a minute left with you. This is a show that flow on by, my friend. It flowed really, really nice. Dr. Kurt Honda, tell everybody where they can find your podcast. Uh, psychologyinseattle.com.
That simple. Yep. And on iTunes. Yep. Yeah. And all the places where you get podcasts. YouTube. We have a YouTube channel as well. Psychology in Seattle. Hey, I really appreciate you doing this and going the distance with us tonight, Dr. Kirk. It has been just a, a real good experience in, in learning tonight, I think, for all of us out here in Spaced Out Radio Land. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. It was fun talking with you. All right. You hold on because I got to take this thing into break here because we're going to go to the bottom of the hour. We're going to hop out for break. 